Well, thanks again for gathering today and for joining us, whether you are joining us right here in this room or whether you are joining us right there online. We're grateful that you are. And I especially want to take a moment, if I can, to thank those who have recently just started joining us, whether it is online or whether there's this gathering that you've come. Because I understand that it takes some risks to step into something new. And, and oftentimes when you step into something new, I don't know if you're, you're like me, it can be really, really easy to sort of feel like that everybody else knows what's going on. Right? Like you're sort of like on the outside looking in. And that can be really frustrating, especially if you're trying to connect, right? You come to a physical gathering or church or you watch online for the purpose of connecting. And so if you come to a place and you feel like you're on the outside looking in, it really makes it hard to connect and then it can be really discouraging. I know what that's like, especially if there's some moments and some times where you feel like that everybody else is speaking a language or saying some things that, that they all grasp and understand and everyone's nodding their head. You know what I'm saying? But, but you're not necessarily tracking with that. When COVID started back in March of uh, 2020 or so, we, my wife and I found ourselves with more time in the same place together. And so one of the things that we started doing for probably our sanity, but also just to make sure that, that we were connecting better was we started taking daily walks. We probably do it five, six, sometimes seven days a week. Many of you are in this room or in our neighborhood, we wave and see and, and that sort of thing. And one of the main purposes, again, is to just connect at a deeper level. However, I want you to know that over the last 21 years or so that we've been together, I've had to learn that my wife speaks a language that isn't my native language. And it has nothing to do with her being female, me being a male. It has everything to do with her working in a school system and me not. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You work in a particular environment, maybe the government or a school system or whatever, where you have codes for everything. Right, right. You talk to your friends, you use like initials and numbers and words, and it makes sense to those of you inside the group. And so she's had to teach me like when she's walking because she's telling me about her day, that's what she does. I tell her about my day. Right? And she used words like IEP or child study or 504 or 1040 EZ. I'm just making that up. I don't even still know what a lot of these are. But, but how crazy would it be, right, for the very purpose and goal of us getting together to communicate and to, and to connect but not understand the language. And so in recognizing that there still are some people who are engaging recently, I don't want you to feel like you've come to connect but you're on the outside looking in. And so for some of us who've been here this whole year, this is going to be repeat. And some are like, oh, I know this already. Okay, let's reinforce it a little bit. For some of us, maybe we just need a reminder for others of us, this is brand new. Our heart and our desire this year at Christian Fellowship Church is to help us to be people that are not just having a transactional relationship with the God of the universe. I do this, he'll do this. I don't do this, he won't do this. To live in fear or that he's not personal. But rather, our heart and our desire is to understand that we can have a transformational relationship with the God of the universe. That he loves us and he's there with us and he makes a difference. Yet, even though... We might say words like we want a transformational relationship. We also have to confess that many times we don't know actually how to get something that we want. And so what we've been doing and what we'll continue to do throughout this year is introduce us to some cadences or rhythms, seven of them specifically, that we feel like if we could just sort of not add on to our life, but integrate into our life, it will help us to be more how God wants us to be. And so we've talked about some of them already in little mini series. We've talked about all of them from passing from time to time, things like daily devotion, prayer, sharing your story, freedom from strongholds. We're going to talk about celebration in a few weeks. And we just finished a series on what it means to be sacrificially generous. And this morning though, we're going to talk about something that seems obvious at first and maybe simple at first, but yet it's a whole lot bigger than we might realize. And that's the idea of what it looks like to be people who serve. You ever had a time where you thought something was gonna be simple or you thought something was gonna be easy, but then because of circumstances or life or lack of understanding of how a process works, it's just a little more than you thought it would be, right? 
Two weeks ago, it was Easter. We all gathered and celebrated and had an opportunity to speak about the truth of Jesus Christ. I used an illustration about the fact that my dishwasher had broken. Some of you remember that, right? And it leaked down into my ceiling. Well, here is what I was so naive to believe a couple of weeks ago. That I could actually get online to said big box store, order said replacement dishwasher, and said replacement dishwasher from said big box store that I paid said money for, by now would be at my house and installed. <laughs> what was I thinking? Right? So I get on said big box store, I order said big box thing, it shows up said dented. So they're like, hey, here's the deal. We'll give you a cosmetic allowance. Now, my sixth love language is cheap, so I was okay with that. My wife was okay with that. <laughs> so they did a little bit. They said, I'll give you a cosmetic allowance. But they said, listen, you can't return it for a cosmetic reason, you know, if you change your mind. I'm like, all right, that's fine. All right, I can deal with that. Take the money back. So I'm out in the garage doing some things with a friend of mine, and they come in and they install it, and they run the water in, they come out and said, everything's good. And I said, great, I sign off, and they leave, and I pay no attention that, number one, they don't remove my old dishwasher that I paid for. They left it there. So I have to call them back. Oh, yeah, we'll be back here on Tuesday. I'm like, I was already here on Friday. It took a day to be here in that window of time that you're going to show up, right? Sorry, we can't be back till Tuesday. I'm like, can I just leave it outside? They're like, no, you have to physically be there for someone to sign off on picking up my piece of junk dishwasher. Ah, I'm okay with that until that evening when I'm at a lacrosse game with my wife and my daughter calls us from home and she goes, the, the dishwasher's making this weird beeping noise. So I come home, five minute drive, and it's given this error, error code. I know it by memory now because it's still flashing, E4F8. You look up E4F8 and said big box dishwasher company, it says if this is professionally installed, Call the manufacturer. I've not even run my dishwasher once. And so for over four and a half hours, I've been on the phone back and forth, trying to get said dishwasher fixed. Last Monday morning, they told me to call at this time. And so I call and I talk to the 17th representative I've talked to at the time. And I get on there and the person now tells me this, I'm sorry, sir, you can't get a replacement dishwasher because you took that cosmetic allowance. I read something recently <laughs> that says this, who you really are is how you ask for a manager when you're not happy. <laughs> I'm grateful the office was very quiet at 8 a.m. on Monday because I was not. <laughs> it seemed like it was going to be simple. So I'm praying, you can pray with me if you're a praying person, this afternoon. At 5 o'clock, I'm supposed to get a call about the magic dishwasher that's supposed to show up tomorrow. We'll see. Maybe God's interested in giving me another illustration next week. I don't want one, just for the record. <laughs> but my point is, we've all had those moments where something should be simple. Which just makes sense. It must be work. Yet it comes to be so much more complex. Most of the time, when it gets more complex and more difficult, something is wrong. But in this case, I want to say this being more complex than what we might think is supposed to be up front is actually something that is right. Last week when Pastor Mike was talking about our last talk in the sacrifice series, what it means to be sacrificial, he alluded to Galatians chapter 5 verse 13, which says this, serve one another, rather verse 15, serve one another in love. And we get there, we're like, okay, we're supposed to serve one another, supposed to serve one another. And I think the natural reaction is, as soon as we hear a verse like that, we're like, okay, what am I supposed to do? 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 And that, by the way, that's not a bad question to ask. But I would like to submit, before we talking about the what of our serve, maybe we should think first about the where that we serve. Like the actual physical location. Because did you know this? You are where you are on purpose. You're where you are on purpose. You are not where you are by mistake. And we're going to look at that and how that's key to understanding this rhythm of serving this morning from our Bibles in the book of Acts chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, open them up. We're going to be there in Acts chapter 17. We'll pick up in verse 24, but I want to give you some context. When we dive into Acts chapter 17 this morning, the Apostle Paul is going to be speaking. He's given a sermon on a place called Mars Hill in Athens, right? What would happen is this is a group of, a place where a group of people would gather together and they would just interact with all the great ideas of the day. And so Paul shows up 
And he's going to tell them the truth about the greatest thing ever, Jesus. And so he shows up and he happens to notice while he's there, there's an altar to an unknown God. And he wants to tell them and to reveal the knownness around this God that they don't understand. And while these people in that moment, they had some truth about God, the truth about God was a whole lot bigger than they thought. And so here's what Paul's audience is going to have happen to them. And maybe we will as well. We're going to be hit a little bit by some real truths about God that maybe we don't grasp at first. And this is what Paul says in Acts chapter 17, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, he does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. You see, how people viewed God in the ancient world was that he was someone who was impersonal. And at best, you would go to God as someone that you would want to keep happy. You want to stay on the good side of God, right? Or you would go to him when you needed him. In that world, God stayed away from us, and the people had absolutely no hope for an actual real relationship with God. They were by very definition transactional with the God of the universe. I won't do this, so you won't do this. I'll do this, so you do this. I only come to you when I need something, much like I approach the ATM when I need some financial help. There was no transformation. And by the way, the two main religions of that day, Stoicism and Epicureanism, Stoics and Epicureans, right? They both approach life that way. And the truth about how they approach life way back then 2,000 years ago is actually not too far off about how many people approach life today. You know, they say that the more things change, the more things stay the same. Heard that before? We're doing a class on Wednesday night gathering called Passing Your Faith Down or Handing Your Faith Down to the Next Generation. And behind that is a study that's revealed that the religion, predominant religion of the day, especially in the United States for young adults, is not a religion that you would have known their name. Maybe you've taken a world religion class and you've learned about Hinduism or Islam or Judaism. Certainly we know the truth about God and Christianity. Historically, this is how people would identify themselves. This is what we believe. But what we discover now is what's happening is, is that people are taking a little of this, a little bit 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 of this. They've kind of gone, gone to the buffet of the world and they've kind of put their own stuff together and created a, a religion of their own that can best be described as this, moralistic therapeutic deism. That there's a God in the universe that wants us to be good and nice and kind. We interact with him like he's our butler, our therapist, but he's not actively involved in our life day in and day out. It looks a whole lot like what they would think some 2,000 years ago. And so what's occurring is then and today is that people didn't know what was true about God. And so Paul is trying to let them know what's true about God. He wants them to know, look, he is the God of the universe. Yahweh, the truth. This is who he is. This unknown God that you're talking about, let me give him a name. And by the way, as he was looking around, he was seeing temples when he's standing on this hill. And he said, look, he's not contained in any of those temples. By the way, the God of the universe actually contains the temples. You know the old song where kid, he's got the whole world in his hand. I mean, if you don't know that song, you at least saw the Coke commercial, right? <laughs> Some of you need to Google that reference. Um, He's not contained by that, but he contains everything. And when you think about that, the God who's that great and that powerful, who doesn't actually need us, consistently is the one who gives life and he gives breath to everything. And by everything, that means you and me as well. I mean, do we think about that in that way? I mean, have we ever once thought about the graciousness of God? Even today, I mean, we got up this morning, right? Right? We most likely went to the shower. We got out of the shower. We got dressed, right? What do we did? We went downstairs. We have a downstairs, a ranch. You went to the kitchen, right? You made yourself breakfast when you were done. If you had a dishwasher working, you put the dishes in the dishwasher. <laughs> you then go about the rest of the things that you were doing that day. You got into a car. 
You came here. You sat down. Or if you're at home, you just made that three feet move from where your coffee was in the kitchen over to where you're watching now. Whatever it might be. Did you do any of that and think to yourself this morning that you're breathing and living because the God of the universe is allowing us to breathe and to live? There's a concept in correcting the idea of who God was that Paul is driving towards, and this is it. This is the truth, that God is gracious. God is gracious. This wasn't exactly how they thought of God day in and day out, but he doesn't stop there. He goes in verse 26. He says, and he made from one man, this being Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Having determined, or two other words that can be used for determined, appointed or designated, allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling places. Listen, God did not just randomly create. He created with detail and he created with purpose. He created the times and the places where everyone is supposed to live. There's a time and a place for everyone and everything, and everyone and everything has a time and a place. That's what he's trying to tell us here. But some of us don't really think about the purposeful nature of God. When my kids were younger, they did Legos a lot. Any of you? Right? Some of you still know the words you had to confess that you said out loud when you stepped on the Lego. Right? Yeah. Probably the same words that you said when you were on the phone on Monday talking to a representative around. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, the other day, my wife bought something and put it together that was Legos that caught me off guard. I took a picture of it. They sit on our um, little kitchen table. Those are Lego flowers. Isn't that awesome? That's probably also my wife telling me, buy her some real ones. I'm not sure. <laughs> but if you ever open up a Lego design, there is a plan and a pattern. And some of you don't like that. You're like, eh, there's some stuff. Let's just try it. Whatever turns out, it turns out. Right? They're different types of people. I'm not saying if you just try to do things willy-nilly and things are crazy and you do what you're own that you're a bad person. I'm just saying for those of us who like to follow the instructions, you're a bit stressful. But those of us who like to follow the instructions, for the other people, we lack creativity. Here's the amazing thing about God. He's got them both. But he does it very purposefully. I say that because nothing about what we experience, about where we are and how we put together is sort of random. And this really, really mattered in light of the truth of how people thought about God then and also today. That not only is God gracious, but here's something else. God, it's the truth, is purposeful. And there's lots of reasons that God is gracious. There's lots of reasons that God is purposeful. But one of the main reasons here that Paul is trying to let these people know, and us by the way, that God is both gracious and purposeful... It said in verse 27, that they, this means anyone who doesn't have a relationship with God, should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. You know that old saying, there's nothing new under the sun? Let me tell you something. You know this guy? His name is Waldo. <laughs> and before Waldo existed, that's how people believed they had to find God. Several years back, go back there in April Fool's, actually Google Maps and Waldo joined together. You could find Waldo on Google Maps. I thought it was brilliant. I wasted hours. <laughs> but if you've ever been around it, you know he's hard to find. And people really thought that way about God. But God is not Waldo where we need to figure out where he is. Instead, he is purposefully and he's purposeful in placing people in times and places so that the result would be that people would come to know the truth about God. You see, because not only is God gracious, not only is God purposeful, this is the third thing, God is near. You see, remember the people at Athens had some truth but the real truth about God was a whole lot bigger than what they thought. And Paul wanted them to see the whole truth. And this is the whole truth in a nutshell, the gospel. That each and every one of us have sinned. We're not perfect. We've broken a relationship with God with what we have done. That's the bad news. 
The good news is, is that even though all of us have done it, and when I mean all, that means all of us, that God did not leave us in that place of brokenness if we do not choose, rather, I'll say this, God did not leave us in that place of brokenness, but we can stay in that place of brokenness if we do not choose to follow him. Here's what I mean by that. That God recognized that we couldn't fix our problems, so he sent Jesus to this earth. That's what we call Christmas, right? He's born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a spotless, sinless life for 30 some odd years. And then he paid the penalty and died on the cross for anyone since who chose to believe on him that day on Good Friday. And then he rose victorious over sin, death, and the grave. That the God of the universe who created all of this became so near in our life to show us grace and was purposeful so that we do not have to be separated from God anymore. That's the whole truth. Those people, those people who were on the mountain at the time, they, they didn't get that. They didn't know that. And, and I still think there's a whole lot of us still today that they don't get that. And maybe you're like, all right, hold on a second. I thought you were talking about serving others today. Right? Yet so far, you spent a lot of time, Brian, talking. You not once meant serving others. Well, just hold on. Let's hold on, right? Now, follow me here. Have you ever had a moment where you should have seen something, but you just missed it, right? Recently, my daughter has been going over what she would like to call an old movie list she would like to see. I want to tell you the words old are very relative. <laughs> There's a movie, came out in 1999 called Sixth Sense. Some of you seen it? Like this little kid, right? He's, I see dead people. Really freaky movie. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth about that movie. If you get upset with that, get over it. It's been out for 23 years, okay? But I just want to warn you. Haley Joe Osmond, this little kid, sees dead people. And so he's got this guide all the way through, played, played by Bruce Willis. And the twist at the end of the movie is this, is that Bruce Willis was actually a dead person as well. So you're like, oh, yeah, I gave it away. It's okay. <laughs> but what's amazing, if you go back and rewatch that movie, you think to yourself, how did I not see that? Some of you who said you saw that up front are lying. Now, maybe some of you did, right? But it, it's obvious when you go back and rewatch it. Why do you say that? I would like to submit for many of us, the call to serve is actually sitting right in front of us, but we haven't seen it. But if we look at it through a different lens, it's obvious. See, here's the thing. God has graciously and purposely set people in times and places so that people can be found, right? That people can find God, right? Yet, can we know this, that too often people don't find God. They find pieces, that's the tragedy of verse 27. If we actually understand its original grammar and context, when it says, yet he is actually not far from each one of us, it's letting us know that too often, even though he's right there near, too often people don't find God. Now, it doesn't mean they don't find a peace. Moral therapeutic deism, moralistic, that's got a peace, but it's not the truth. Too often... People walk around and God is near and, and yet they don't grasp it. Which brings me to this question. Here it is. What if God's purposeful, grace-showing closeness is supposed to be shown by God's people who he has purposefully and gracefully placed? What if part of God's plan in purposely and grace showing closeness to draw people to him is shown out by God's people who, by the way, he also purposely and gracefully places. I'm going to read you a couple of scriptures. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says this, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, here it is, to do good works, to serve, which God prepared in advance for us to do, purpose. Part of his Lego plan, right? Book of Matthew chapter 5. This is Jesus speaking, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill, it cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So if we take these verses in Acts chapter 17 and we combine them with what was just said in Ephesians chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 5, that God created us to do good things and that 
we are people who are supposed to shine His light, and that God created us all to be in a certain time and place, we can't help but understand this fact when it comes to serving. Here it is. We have been graciously placed by God in a time and a place to help others find Him. It's not actually scripturally debatable. See, serving is a whole lot bigger than we usually think. Yes, we need to think about the what we should do. But just as critical about the what we should do is thinking about through this concept about the where God has placed us to do the what he's called us to do. Because God does everything on purpose. Now, it doesn't mean that there's not some challenges in hearing that. I mean, because as great as that sounds, living out a what in the where he's put you can be challenging. Why? Because people are messy. I mean, and and we're people in general, right, that try to avoid messy. I mean, some of us have, have changed jobs, changed relationships, physically moved from our condo or townhome or home or apartment or whatever to a different geographical location to avoid messy. One of the truths of life is this, is we tend to run from instead of run towards messy. I didn't wake up this morning saying, God, give me a mess. <laughs> How about you? I woke up this morning and said, God, please let my dishwasher come. But I didn't say, give me a mess. Yet, if we understand these verses at a deeper level, we need to realize that it is just quite possible that the God of the universe has placed us right where we are in the middle of that mess. So we serve others so that others might see God and that the God that seems far can be recognized that he's actually near. But to embrace that, though, we have to be people who are willing to think differently than we often do. Because beneath the actions that we make, the decisions that we make, is actually what we really believe about the world, ourselves, and God in any moment. And one of the things that we talked about in the last series that we just finished, talking about this idea of sacrifice, the wrong belief about us is that God's first desire for us is comfort. And if we believe that and don't recognize that there are times that God calls us to sacrifice, that means that when God calls us to sacrifice and to serve in a particular way, in a particular way that he's called us to, if we believe that God's first desire is our comfort, we're not going to do it. But that's not his first desire. His first desire is that we might know him deeper. His first desire is so that people will be drawn to him. And his first desire is that he will transform us. See, one of the truths about serving is that it's not actually at all about comfort. It is about a willingness to sacrifice. And so, as we find our way towards our close and in this morning, I just have a few questions I want us to consider about our where. These are questions that that I'm, I'm going to say that we should ask God before, before, We choose to run from the mess of our jobs, our family, our neighborhood, or any other situation that we find ourselves in. By the way, the reasons that we need to ask God this is we talked about this earlier on in the series is God does not work like we do. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so we need to be checking our ways and our thoughts and asking. So here are three things. Here's the first question we need to ask ourselves. Does God still want me here to serve and love others. The book of Ecclesiastes is not a book that a lot of people read a lot. But because we know old songs, we know to every season turn, turn. You know, you know that song, right? Stop singing it and listen to what I'm going to say now, right? But here's the point. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 is where that comes from. There's a season and a time for everything. And so it is quite possible That in the middle of your mess where God has placed you to serve, there may be a season and a time that you are to move on. But that's God's call, not yours or mine. Before we become people who immediately decide, I need to remove myself from the messiness and serving the mess. It might be time to serve in a different place, but don't assume it until we ask. There's a second thing. What does God want to transform in me? By placing me here to serve. Do you notice how easy it is for us to think that service is always about the other person? 
But I want to tell you this, that if God's interested in not only transforming others through our service, He's interested in transforming us when we choose to serve. God, what are you trying to do in this moment that I'm looking at? And you said, nope, you can't leave this. God, are you trying to grow my trust in you? Ever felt that? We're like, God, I feel like you're calling me into this, and this doesn't make a lot of sense. But God says, maybe God's trying to transform you by growing your trust. Because if the God of the universe loves you enough to send you Jesus, he's not going to put you or me in a situation that isn't in our best benefit, even if we feel like he's not being faithful at the moment. God, you want to grow my trust? God, you just want to grow my grace. You had those people in your life, extra grace required people? Don't look at anyone. But you, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> extra grace. God, are you trying to grow my grace? Maybe God wants to change your heart because you have a view of some other person's issues or problems or whatever that is completely and utterly skewed because you don't know their story. You ever found yourself drawing a conclusion about a group or a people or a person that you're called to serve, but then when you get in and you know your story, you're like, ah. Second is, God, what do you want to transform in me by placing me here to serve? And here's the third. How? How does God want me to spend my time while I'm here? So it's a little reflection on the what. I know I'm supposed to serve, but how am I supposed to do this what? God, do you want me to show your truth? By physically serving. No expectations. Do what he's asked you to do. Whatever that scenario may be, God, go and do it. And don't look for a ribbon. Don't post it on Instagram. I served this week, right? That's not what this is about. But it actually means sacrificially serving in that way. God, you want me to do it physically. However... Some of us are like, yes, that's the one. But we feel really uncomfortable if God asks us to serve by speaking truth. Some of us are like, yes, speak truth. That's me. I don't want to do. Right? It, it's, it's a both end. That God has graciously put you in someone's life and in your realm of influence to speak not from your place, but from God's place of truth in their life. Because they need to hear, listen. You and I are where we are on purpose. And God has a desire to use us to serve there in some capacity. Yet too often, if we're not careful, we hear things like serve one another. And we start off on the what and forget the where. Having determined, appointed, designated, allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God. And perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. This morning as we close, I, I just I want to take a moment, if I can, to go back to something that I spoke just a few moments ago. This is the truth of the gospel. Because if I believe that God set time and places for things to happen, I have to be confident that you are here today for a reason whether it's in this room or watching online. And maybe the reason is, is today is your time to understand the full truth about God. That he came through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took upon human flesh. He came, he lived and died and paid the penalty of our sins so that we can put back in a relationship with God so that all of us who choose to believe on the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us can be guaranteed eternal life when this life passes to the next with God and also be guaranteed in this life right now that God will be there to help us no matter how messed up, screwed up, or blown up your life might be. He has not abandoned you. And He will be there with you. And you can sing songs like, all my life He's been faithful. And even if it doesn't feel that way, you know it's true because of what He's done. So I'm going to ask people for just a moment, I do this every once in a while, not to make anyone feel uncomfortable, but actually to maybe make another group of people feel comfortable. That if you're in this room, if you don't mind just sort of bowing your head and closing your eyes, if you're at home, I know you don't need to do that. But in this room, if I could just ask you to do that for a moment, because what I want to do is I want to take a moment that if you have never heard this truth before about the gospel, about what God wants to do through Jesus Christ and accept his payment for your sin, 
or maybe you've heard it before, but never accepted it. But today is the day you want to engage that as the truth in your life. I just want to have an opportunity to pray for you. A couple of weeks ago on Easter, 14 people decided to accept that truth about God and their life has been changed because of that. And today your life can be changed as well. And so I'm going to take a moment. Now every, every head's bowed and every eye's closed. But if you're in this room today, and you just want to let me know that you've made that decision today. In just a moment, I'm going to look across the room. I just want you to kind of look up and I'll try to catch your eye. All you need to do is nod to me. We're not about trying to track you down. We just want to pray for you. If you're online right now, you're doing this. All you need to do is, is let uh, the people who are guiding and directing you today online, just know that maybe throw up a hand or send them a direct message, whatever it might be. But I do want to just take a moment right now. Don't want to miss this opportunity. So if you're here and you've made that decision today, you can just look up and I'll look at you and we'll know. Thank you. I've missed you today. The good news is that God has not. He's seen you and he knows your heart because it's not about nodding to me. The God of the universe who made this and holds us all together knows your heart. And he's heard your confession today. And so God, thank you. Thank you for being so much bigger than we often think that you are. So big that you save us and that you call us. In Jesus' name. I invite you, if you would like to stand, to stand. If you want to stay seated, to stay seated. But to reflect on these words and respond in your heart.